people build their whole business around a certain platform that they don't control. And then when that platform changes or that company makes a change, you know, you can lose your whole business overnight. You know, again, that's kind of what you see happening with YouTube creators and the algorithm, and they're so beholden by the algorithm and everything now. So uh, we originally met uh, back in, I don't even remember, like 2016 or something or 2015 when you're doing Walnut Street Labs. Actually, you know what? I take it back. We met at uh, Philly Startup Hackers. Correct. And we met at DuckDuckGo's headquarters. I mean, they're a remote company, but they have, uh, you know, headquarters um, in um, out by you. And so we were at a... What was it? It was like just the... It was Philly Startup Hackers. I was actually talking to Bob Moore yesterday. He's coming on the the podcast in a couple of weeks or uh, probably February. But uh, yeah, it was Bob and uh, and Gabe Weinberg, I think is his name, yeah. who started uh, yeah. Philly Startup Hackers. And I was just thinking we need something else like Philly Startup Hackers to to happen again in Philly. It was so cool. It was just all these like yeah. founding nerds who just got together and just like wrote code and you know, yeah, just and like super ca- yeah, super casual. And, um, and it's just, it's funny that, you know, it, it, just like that, like looking back, um, I think Gabriel from the started DuckDuckGo was um, just such a, such a huge influence on me at least. Cause it's like, here's this guy who before, and this was actually once they started to get some traction, but like, if you go back just a year from then, you know, here was this guy like in his basement. Uh, he had sold a previous company and he, I guess he kind of figured like, you know, I, I just want to like, I have, he, he had a pretty good exit and he was kind of set. And so he was just like, you know what, I'm just going to like dedicate my, figure out something and just dedicate my life to it. And he, um, he decided to build a, a search engine to, and go up against Google. And it was just this like single, this guy in his basement building this, you know, hacking away, building this search engine. And you talk about swinging were like, dude, business. like, <laughs> yeah, people, people were like, like, are like this, that's crazy. Like, you know, to like this global conglomerate and you have this one guy in his basement, you know, building the search engine. And so I think that's such a cool Well, he kind of pulled it off. I mean, you know, he's not like anywhere near Google's market cap or revenue, but that's by design in a lot of ways. And he kind of pulled off, you know, there's a pretty, it's not a big chunk of the pie, but there's a definitely a slice of the pie that has left Google to use exclusively DuckDuckGo. Right. And that's what he realized. I think, well, I think there's, there's just so many parts of that story that you can look at and, and learn from and, and, um, the first or one of them is it didn't start out like right now, DuckDuckGo, when people hear DuckDuckGo, they think of, of like privacy and it's all about privacy and protecting your data and, you know, not being tracked. But originally it started out as kind of just this, he built, I think it's this search engine that was a little bit more, um, like hacker friendly or yeah. he kind of targeted it like at that community, hence hosting Philly startup hackers. And just like targeting at developers and stuff. And then, you know, around maybe 2014, there was this this huge shift um, where there was an like a big focus on privacy and people started to realize like Google's tracking everything that you do. And they people started to realize like how they're actually making money. And Gabriel was was really smart, I think, and just like noticed that trend and pivoted into it and um and then just redid everything to be essentially focused on privacy um and so as like a as a startup that's so i think that's such a great thing to learn from like you know you're rarely going to end up where you first envisioned yourself so it's it's really about taking advantage of like those opportunities like looking for those opportunities um kind of building like a foundation and positioning yourself so you can quickly pivot into a area of growth so he he was one of those i I had a few conversations with him mostly at those philly startup hacker events and he was one of those founders who just like 
he swung for the fences and he just had a singular vision and wasn't yeah. going to let anything get in his way. And when I, the few times I talked to him, it was like, you know, if you don't have something really interesting to say in the first 30 seconds, you like his, he just glazes off and you yeah, can he just gl- exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much how all of my conversations went with him as well. Um, <laughs> but um, so I, I don't think I ever had like a super uh, super in depth conversation with him. Maybe because of that, maybe because I just never had something that was interesting enough to say. But um, but he's it's still super inspiring, and I think that that his um, he had this blog when when he first started out too. I don't know if he's it's still up or not, but just like Doc, and that's how I kind of know the backstory. Like I didn't talked to him about all this but it's all on his blog or was on his blog and um and so one of the things that he mentions on there that really had a big impact on me was like if you're going to become if you're going to go into if you're going to build a startup or any type of company like or become an entrepreneur or founder or whatever like you, you should make that your career like that should be a career choice it shouldn't be a, you know, I might try this and maybe it will work. Maybe it won't. I'll spend a couple hours here, spend a couple of hours there. Um, like, I think maybe it can initially start out like that, but like the idea is again, and I think it, it kind of leads into that idea of like, like building a, a strong foundation and then pivoting into an area of growth um, is like, he, you know, clearly, as you said, like he swung for the fences and like, he wasn't going to let anything stop him. So that was his like all intentional. It was like, I'm going to make this my career. It might take a year. It might take five years, but I'm going to find a way to make it work. And if this doesn't work, I'll just, I'll do something else. But that, but my career is building companies yeah. um, and looking at it like that. Yeah. I think this will be, when this goes live, this will be like episode 16 or 17. Uh, not sure yet, but uh one of the threads that has come up in previous episodes multiple times is that like as founders, we have screws loose somewhere in our brains mm-hmm. and uh, like the kind of companies me and you are building, we have some screws loose. I think the kind of companies that he builds, like his screws are really loose somewhere like to, <laughs> <laughs> to go after those that like that size of a market to attack literally the largest tech company on the planet. Yeah. Or, you know, the top two, I don't know if Google or Apple has a bigger market cap these days, but like to go after one of the biggest tech companies on the planet and try to take their lunch, that is, you know, that's like a next level, uh, you know, like moonshot. It is. But I think like as a small company you have, or even as like an individual, you actually have advantages. And I, I think that people like don't often realize this, but like you're able to move quicker in many ways than these big companies you know companies they grow and they grow and they grow and as they grow they get bigger they have pot they get bureaucracy gets put into place they have different departments the different departments so like when they go to build a new product it becomes this just ginormous like endeavor because you need to have teams and you need to run it by legal and you need to do this and you need to do that and as an individual, you're just like, you know, I'm just going to build this today. Like it's, there's not, so I think in many ways people don't realize that, but they actually have, um, there are, there are many advantages to being, to being, uh, a solo, you know, just working on something on your own or having a small team. Um, one of the things I think he figured out too, that was really interesting to me because like the common, uh, knowledge or like ideology of building a search engine back then was that you needed and it probably still is today largely you need a massive data center and you need to index the world's knowledge and then you need to build an algorithm on top of that and have an index so you can query and then serve results real real quick back to the user and you can't do those searches in real time because it takes too long but i think that's what he figured out was how to use like wikipedia and wikidata and all this like structured data on the internet to do somewhat like real time searches and then get results that were, you know, probably as good or close to as good as Google right. results. Like, yeah. Like the original kind of like how you have the snippets now, like, it, like that's, and that's when I was earlier, when I was talking about like the original mission or the original kind of structure of DuckDuckGo was um, the, the, to have like additional feature, like to be more than just the search engine and have like data other data like directly into the in the search results and now you see google does that with everything you know and there's a lot of talk about um uh, about how the uh the open ai and and other a lot of data like that is going to 
transform um, search results. But but Dr. But I think they probably took some inspiration from what he was doing with the um, with that whole thing. And I think they even had like a platform for developers where you could develop like you could submit like a widget or a, I don't know I forget what they called them exactly. And if it was approved, then it would actually show up like in the search results, like your date, like the data structure that you built. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, they had something like Duck Duck Hackers, or I forget what it was called. It was some sort of like a sub hacker community underneath uh, Duck Duck Go that was like powering mm -hmm. all their uh, all their tech. That was really cool. Uh, so you bring up uh, GPT and OpenAI, uh, and I saw that Bing just partnered with OpenAI. They're trying to re reinvigorate Bing to uh, potentially be a new contender on Google. Uh, I have to think that Google, like they've got the deep minds uh, machine learning that's like hush hush under the under the hood, they don't really talk about it. They just use it to power mm -hmm. their products. So I have to think Google's working on something that we just don't know about to the full extent yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's interesting that Bing, uh, if they pull this off, could considerably like wipe out a chunk of Google because you know Google relies fully on advertising revenue. That's like a huge, you know, like I don't, it's like ninety percent or something of their revenue. I don't know the exact number, but they're mostly powered by ads. So if you take away the ads from Google, if you just serve the answer right away and you don't get the ad revenue, then, uh, and you're providing better answers in real time with AI, uh, that is a pretty big disruption to Google's business model. Yeah. Um, I mean, at, uh, writing IO, we've been, um, using or working with, um, the, uh, chat uh gpt i always get g gdp gd gpt um quite a bit because we're actually building it into some of our products and not not um chat uh gpt uh in particular but some of their uh other models and um and i think it's interesting you know uh when you it's one of those things where i think when you first use it it's like I, like when you first probably used VR. You, have you tried? V, I assume by now you've used the VR headset. Yeah, we've been out. My wife and I have been out. <laughs> okay, so you first use VR, and you're like, "This is like unbelievable." You're like, "This is I'm never going to play a video. I'm never going to play a game on like a 2D screen again. Like this is going to put all of those. It's going to be they're going to be gone, right?" Then about three months go by, and you're back to playing games on your television uh, or on a 2D screen. Um, and I think that's because like, it's it's just, it's super magical to begin with, but as time goes by, you start to discover things that are actually better in 2D um, or better, uh, at least for now, you know? And I think with um, with a lot of these, these AI models, um, when you first use them, or if you spend just a couple of minutes using them, which most people do because they will see a link on Twitter or something and go click and put a prompt in and be like, oh my God, I it could write this, wrote this whole essay. Um, but as you use them more, or at least as we've used them more, I think that there are, you start to see through some of the magic, I guess you could say. And I, while I think that there will be a lot of um, amazing use cases for it, I'm not sure, like a, a great, um, like you always hear like, you know, AI is going to replace um, writers or AIs, but a lot of it, like, um, like, uh, like from a, at least from a communication standpoint, like writing is something that's like, you're sharing an experience experience that you had as a person, you know, like a, like a, like, and, and regardless of the type of writing that you're doing, it's like, you know, you're this conscious being and you're sharing your kind of this point of view. When you start reading something that was produced by AI, you, there's this, there's a piece of it that's kind of lost. I don't, it's hard to like really explain, but as the reader, like, you know, like there's, there's no like there's no soul behind like there's like there was there wasn't a, a shared experience behind like uh, behind this you know like well, there's, there's two, two threads there so first one uh you know these these uh gpt models or whatever you know machine model you're training you still need to feed it content 
Correct. So yeah. Maybe eventually you can have models feeding models, but I, I don't know where that goes. That probably develops a language we don't even understand as humans. But uh, you know, you've got uh, you still need to feed content to the model for it to be able to produce an output. Correct. And uh, and then the other thing before before we move on from it, the Oculus. I was just thinking about that the other day because I was listening to uh, Palmer Lucky on the My First Million podcast. I don't know if you listen to that. But uh, mm -hmm. I was listening to him and I was thinking about it because my wife uses the Oculus, but she only uses it to work out. She used to use it for mm -hmm. like playing things, playing mm -hmm. games, but now she only uses it as like an exercise thing. <laughs> and I, was, I was thinking like the fr there's friction to it. So in, when you play on the 2D screen, you know, you sit up on the couch, you can, you know, put your, your Cheetos on your on your lap and, uh, you know, re relax back and play the game. And, you know, you just push one button, your TV's on, your game's on, but the Oculus, you have to like, clear a spot in your living room, you have to pull it out of the box, put it on your head, adjust the strap, turn it on, navigate to the game, and then you have to move and like interact physically it's with intense, it. It's so, intense, you know, it's yeah. intense. It's, it's like an intense, it's a different type of experience. Like it's fundamentally a different type of experience. And so maybe future generations who grow up with that, like they'll just be somehow accustomed to that intense of an experience all the time. But, you know, as somebody who used uses 2d screens a lot um for me like and maybe for you like do i need that intense experience all the time you know i don't know yeah, I mean, yeah it's interesting maybe one day uh the, the Neuralink will uh just you know we'll just be uh ready player one we'll just be like immersed in this it, yeah uh, immersed <laughs> in, totally in the thing and and i just before we kind of move on from this i wanted to you mentioned like how you have to feed models and that's the other and perhaps the biggest um, barrier for search in particular, um, because these what people uh, another thing people like don't realize is that these models are trained on data sets and those data sets, um, it, it doesn't happen in real time. So, for example, if you go to use um, open a any of open AI's. Uh, you know, AI models, um, most of them were trained on 2020 to 2021, like data in that range or that then like, so anything after 2021, if you like try to ask it a question about it, it has no idea um, because it just doesn't, that data isn't available to it. And, and it doesn't, and to have access to that, they need to completely retrain it using an updated data set. So conceivably you could with enough computing power um, just continually train and update these things. But even that, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure from a, from a technical standpoint, like how feasible that is at least at, at current time. So for, you know, any type of data that's current um, there are, there are big holes in the, in the, um, in the AI data sets. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's interesting. And uh, I, I heard somewhere, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was like $100 million or something crazy to train the open AI, like the DaVinci 3 model or something. It was like- right, just one, Yeah, just like once, you know? So it's like, so I think, and that's the other thing people don't realize. It's like when you do a, when you do a, a, a query in that, you know, it takes maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20 seconds to come back or maybe sometimes longer. I mean, depending on the volume. And, and so it's at this point, it's kind of hard to tell if that's an action. I assume some of that is, um, is an actual, like is actual processing time and not just because it's getting hit with so many requests at once. And if that's the case, then, then what you're looking at is a, is, you know, something that requires like an order of magnitude or more compute power per search or per, per query and to scale that at the at, you know at a to up to a search engine I, like i just i wouldn't want to be the engineer that has to figure that out because yeah, I mean, it's an interesting barrier i you know i, I had subconsciously thought about that barrier when mm -hmm. i i heard too that uh like if you try to ask gpt3 about like the ukraine war it doesn't know anything yeah. Yeah. Because and, it's uh, after. Yeah. Yeah. And like I, so I had thought about that before, but this is the most I've actually like actively thought about that problem and how difficult it will be to overcome that barrier to make uh GPT three or, you know, future GPT four, a 
actual real time, uh, you know, competitor to Google. But yeah, exactly. And uh, um, Google, you can like, you know, CNN can publish an article and it's on Google in like a minute. Yeah. It's good. It's good marketing, though, for now. And um, and, I, and don't get me wrong. I think it will happen to some degree. Um, but it's just like, when, again, going back, it's just like that first time trying VR. Like, it's amazing. It's, you know, it's just something you've never experienced before. But then you start to, to feel like, but you kind of at first, um, because of that experience, like you kind of overlooked the, the friction points or the pain points. And while I also think in VR, they'll get them mostly ironed out eventually, you know, it could be five years, could be a decade. Um, it's hard to say, really. It's kind of like when those BlackBerry sidekicks came out originally, it was like amazing. And, yeah. uh, or even like the first gen iPhone back then it was like, wow, this is just absolutely amazing. And, uh, but if we tried to go back and use those devices today, we'd be like, this is a complete, <laughs> like, this is the worst experience. <laughs> you wouldn't even be able to use it, you know, and it, it really was, I mean, the first iPhone, like, yeah, it was good, but it was still like, that's why Blackberry did okay for a while. Cause the keyboard was still like superior, you know, I mean, the, like there was, I don't even know. I mean, I assume there was some kind of like auto correct on the initial iPhone, but it's hard. To, I mean, there wasn't even an app store on the original iOS. So it's hard to really remember. Like it's always, it's always easy to think of like to look at the present and be like, that's what it's always been like. But yeah, then, it's interesting. Um so uh I talked to you once about writing.io. Uh and yeah. that's that's how you say it, right? Writing.io. Writing.io, writing I I just say writing IO because I have to say it so many times. Um, and, but that's the, that's the, 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 the domain name too. So it's, it's writing.io. Yeah. That's a damn good domain, by the way. I'm curious how much you paid for that, but, uh, that was like, you told me about it once and, uh, I'm just curious, like kind of where it's going and specifically how you're using, uh, open AI in, in writing IO. Yeah. So we, um, so I guess actually a good way to explain it in the context of this conversation is to go back to that, like original discussion we had about about DuckDuckGo and, and how how Gabriel was like there in his basement, you know, trying to take on Google. And um, in some ways that inspired me to create this because I had, I you know, had been using WordPress and, and all of these, uh, all of these kind of CMS um, and website tools for, you know, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years now. Um, I mean, I'm not that old, so that kind of puts in context, like when I started using them. Um, but I just like had always since I think since I had used them so much, I, I realized over time that a lot of these, a lot of these, um, the software, especially WordPress, you know, had really become very complex over time. And, um, and I guess the issue with like complexity isn't always a good thing at like having more features isn't always a good thing. And, um, and I think they tried to, they've tried to continually like appease many different groups and make it for many different groups of people. And what happens is that then it kind of becomes good for no one in a sense that it, it becomes like hard to use and complicated for everybody. Um, so and I'm, it sounds like I'm being very harsh on WordPress. I think WordPress is great. I think WordPress, but I think that that WordPress is overkill for 90% of the people that go to use it. And so that's where writing IO comes in. Um, we just wanted to build a super simple, easy way. If you want a great looking uh, site where you can build um, uh, subscribers and then publish content and have that content either displayed on the web or emailed to the to your subscri the subscribers that the subscriber base that you build to just make it really easy to do that and to look great doing it so that you don't need to go and find um, a bunch of plugins and themes and it's like you should just be able to like create a site in five minutes it looks great um, and you can just start writing and publishing content and so that's that's um that's so our focus like, that's uh, like convert kit with like a square space on top of it so it's uh and it's for authors right like you're going after Correct. the author niche 
Yeah, auth- writers, uh, professional writers, authors, content creators, but we're expanding out to um, to uh, many different verticals, but keeping it hyper focused on like writing content and de- making that content look great, and then delivering that content wherever people are most likely to read it. And that's a big part of what we do is that um, instead of expecting your audience to come to you, you know, we make it really easy for you to, to send your content or, or provide your content to your audience wherever they are. So a great example of that is um, through email. So we automatic, so you write a post, you publish it, and that post automatically gets formatted for email. It looks great. It gets, and that same experience that you get on the web gets delivered um, by email as well. And, and uh, yeah. So who, so it's mostly authors using it. Like what's their monetization strategy? Are they mostly trying to sell books or freelance services or, you know, what's like the niche typically doing with your, uh, your, your product? Well, I would say it's people who are trying to build an audience because the whole, your whole site is designed around you capturing subscribers and building an audience. Um, and so uh, for now, the, the primary monetization is building that audience, building an email list, and then monetizing or, or a list of subscribers, essentially, and then monetizing that list through your own products or services or, or, or you know, whatever that may be. So um, some people might offer professional services. Some people might have, you know, books or products that they sell. And then they're able to now reach that that audience um, th- through uh, our, our software. And then, um, um, you know, and then obviously um, a route that we want to go is having... Um, paid subscriptions and stuff like that. But, you know, we're still, we're, we're still working on a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Last time we talked, I think you were still like building it. You had just, yeah, I think you, you had like a landing page up and you're still building the platform. Uh, is it, you know, can people go and sign up for it? Yeah. Right it's, now yeah. And, yeah, it's to- yeah. Totally live. Um, is it free or do you charge like a subscription? We, ha- we have a two week free trial. I mean, it could change. We're always testing things, but, um, but no, I think, I think that's been working pretty well for us. So I think we're going to stick with, with that model. Um, and so people can try it for free, see if it's for them. And, um, what's the price point for, uh, users and the price point is we have a couple different tiers. So if you just want like a basic site, um, we, we noticed that some people were joining and they just wanted like an, like a, like a simple portfolio that looks great. Cause again, we make it like, it takes like, you know, five minutes and you can make a, a great site. So some people just want to use it for the, like that aspect and don't want the, um, don't, don't necessarily need to build an audience or subscribers. So that, um, it starts at 15 bucks a month. And then, um, for people who want the ability to then build an audience, uh, send their posts to where their audience are mo- most likely to read them. So like e- by email, for example, and then do a lot of other really cool custom things. Um, it's, uh, it's about 25 bucks a month. Wow. Yeah. Those are low price points. What, it, how big, uh, I mean, this is like a big space. There's, you know, tons mm-hmm. of SaaS players like, you know, Wix and, you know, Squarespace. And then you've got, you know, all the, uh, like the WordPress and the Drupal's yeah, and all these yeah, open yeah. source, it's a huge, huge space. Uh, how big do you think uh, writing IO could get? Um, for me, it's less about like looking at how big it could get and more about like looking at how can we just continue, like how do we deliver the best experience possible? And I would rather deliver like an amazing experience to a smaller group than to fall kind of into the same category as a WordPress or a Drupal or whatever, and end up scaling it to the point where it loses some of its magic, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think we're just always like hyper aware of that. And that's again, why I created it. So, um, so I think that like from a, from a scale, from us, but it is, but you, you bring up a great point that it's a big ocean. And that's another reason why I'm, why we were focused on this is because 
um, it gives you a lot of room to explore, move around. Um, and, um, and a lot of the companies that you mentioned, like we were talking about earlier, it seems like, you know, we're going up against like all these, you know, Matt, like, how do you compete with that? You know, how do you compete with like, uh, with, a with a WordPress or with a, uh, uh, Wix. Um, but, you know, what ends up happening is, again, these companies, they grow and grow and grow because and and uh, partly because of their underlying financial structure. And we can talk about that in a bit, too, I guess. Um, but they, they're, they're forced to continually grow, essentially. And then they um, they they become this pure like it's very hard for them to 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 pivot and, and launch really great new experiences. And so for us, that's a huge advantage because we can, as a small team, you know, we have six people full time. Um, we can just pivot, you know, like on a dime and look for, if we see something cool, like the, the, uh, like open AI, we can just say, you know, one weekend, I'm going to start working on this and build this into, into writing IO. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, we were playing around with it and we were like, you know, this is, this is amazing. Um, especially in. And you're, you're still coding on the product, right? With certain use cases. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, so it's me and, uh, a CT, I have a CTO and we're, we're the development team. So, and that's cool. honestly like how I like it. Cause that's what I enjoy doing. So it's just, it's so great to be, you know, able to just do something you like to be able to continue to do something you enjoy and, and not have to like get sucked into doing other things all day. You know, I do do, I obviously do do other things and, and have to deal with the, the management side of it too, but um, I'm still able to spend a lot of my time on the product itself. And that's what is so, that's why one of the reasons why we structured it the way that we did. It makes me think of like, uh, you know, like ConvertKit versus HubSpot. You know, HubSpot's this, you know, publicly traded. I, I don't know what their market cap is, but I think it either is or was, you know, over $10, $10 billion. Yeah. Uh, massive products, you know, huge reach in the SMB space. It's kind of like the de facto marketing automation CMS for that SMB market uh, competes with WordPress and has a lot more features than, you know, what out of the box WordPress does. And, uh, and then, you know, convert kit serves that small niche. I think their ARR is in the tens, you know, low to mid tens of millions, uh, small mm -hmm. team, like sub hundred person team, private company, fully bootstrapped. And, uh, you know, it's like a similar model where like, there's a very specific use case where, you know, people that want to pay like $99 or whatever it is a month to use convert kit or like $49, whatever the entry level price is, versus the people who want to go and spend like seven fifty dollars or a thousand dollars a month on the whole HubSpot suite of products. Yeah. Yeah. Convert kit. I mean, that was, an, that was another inspiration uh, for me because they, it was really cool. Um, I think the founder who started that is Nate, his name is Nathan Barry and you know, he was, it's really interesting. That's another interesting story. That would be a great person to have on if he still does, uh, still does podcasts. Yeah. I just um, made a mental note, uh, send him an email. <laughs> um, because he, um, he was like, I, I remember I knew of him back. He did like ebook, like ebooks and courses for design. And he had started that again. It's like, he, I think he grew in the same way I grew frustrated with WordPress and some of these other um, publishing platforms, he, he, the same thing happened to him, but with, um, with email delivery services and like MailChimp and all these services. And, and I think he realized like early on from a, cause he had this blog where he, that's where he, I think he generated a lot of his, his, uh, his traffic and sales from um, he realized early on, like how, how they need to be integrated, like the blog and the email marketing and like how you need to like, all, like a B like to make a B testing really easy and stuff like that. Um, and so he started this like little, pro this, this product almost, it seemed like at least to me, like for himself and then kind of scaled it out and up to, um, and I think he, he kind of wrote um, uh, an article about that, about how he, 
had um, how he had just like made the decision like this is I like I need to put like 100k into this and just give it everything I have and see what happens and I'll give it like a year and um, and then he grew it into this um, you know big I mean it's it's a it's a pretty substantial company now especially for being almost I think it's bootstrapped so yeah it's bootstrapped I think their valuation is for sure in the nine figures but their uh their ARR is like 25 million or something they publish it all they have a web they have a page on their website about uh all of their they they're like one of those building in public companies so yeah yeah yeah. ARR by month and they'll they'll do uh you know what their profit is and you know how many you know how many users churn that month and how many new accounts they added and headcount and like salaries and everything I think it's all publicly listed Actually, I had lunch with the CTO one time. He lives in Concha Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I had lunch with him one time at uh, El Limon on uh, Fayette Street. Uh, I, I'll, I'll reach back out to him and see if I can get Nathan on here. Uh, but uh, yeah, super interesting company. Uh, taking taking a little bit of a, a, a turn here. I, I'd love. I was just looking at Nerd Wallet. I didn't realize, you know, it's like a Nerd Wallet's like a blog. It's like a forum and blog of, you know, like credit cards and what mm-hmm. credit cards give you the best rates and they're publicly traded. I didn't realize they currently have a $700 million market cap, uh, mm-hmm. which means, you know, last year, or the year before they were probably into the billions market cap. And uh, you built website. You, I mean, you you had a bunch of websites in that space. Uh, yeah. I think you were doing like credit card forums and I, I, yeah, yeah, I had a network Amex of financial right? sites. Yeah. And that's, that's actually what let, you know, it's funny because we're kind of going in reverse chronological order or I, it's just like, we're going like forwards, but also backwards. So before I, I, uh, uh, before all of this, I had a network of financial sites and I ended up selling them and then I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I was like, what am I going to do with all my time now? And, um, you know, I just, I had this book sitting on my desk or sitting uh, in my office for the longest time on uh, Ruby on Rails, about Ruby on Rails. And I, I didn't know how to program at the time. I just knew like, I was good at design, good at like front end stuff, but I didn't, you know, programming, forget it. And I, I never like envisioned myself being uh being a developer programmer and I'm just like you know what like I have the time now I'm just gonna I need to just do this so I remember specifically like it was it must have been like May or June up there and and this is when I lived back outside of Philly and uh it was really nice out that day so I literally got like a beach chair and just plopped it in the middle of my backyard and sat down and just started learning how to code in Ruby. And, um, and then, you know, I spent maybe two or three weeks on like, they have these online, these sites that kind of uh, are like online applications that allow you to code and they tell you, you know, what you've done wrong and stuff like that. And that was actually, that made a, a big, it's much easier to learn now than it was um, or, and even then it was much easier to learn than it was like five, five years before that, because you literally just had to like read out of the book, like, and type it in. And, um, and so that was great. But then I'm like, you know, I need to just build something with this to, to, um, to, to learn, to really learn how to, how to do it. I think anybody who's, who's, uh, any programmer can relate to that or developer can relate to that. Like you just, sometimes you just need to like build, like learn by doing, and, um, and yeah, and so that's how, how I started, um, uh, Contena and how, uh, eventually writing IO came about because of that, you know, having those financial sites, selling them, having the, the, a little bit of time on my hands, sitting down in that beach chair and, and going forward with it. Um, but so I just wanted to, to, to add that into there to give people a little bit of context of like where everything came from. But going back to NerdWallet, like, the, you know, I remember when NerdWallet was just like, you know, a couple guys and they, um, you know, they did not bootstrap their company. I mean, maybe at first for a year or so they did, but then they took um, venture capital and, you know, just essentially once you do that, then you're just pressured to what, grow. What year? I mean, how do you 
I, I can't imagine a blog getting venture capital these days. Like how, what year did they well, get? Well, it didn't start. It, it start, I mean, it was a blog, but it really started as it was like a, if you've ever used like, it was like a, like almost like a comparison site. So it was like they built tools to compare. It, it started with credit cards. They built tools to compare credit cards, like different benefits, rates, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. And there was a blog with that, but they really focused on the tools. And then what they would do is they would go, they go out to, you know, uh, big news sites and they become like a contributor for them. And then they get links back to their tools and then they start to rank well in the search results. And then they get a bunch of traffic. The problem with that model is that you're like totally at the mercy of the Google search algorithm. So, um, so, you know, there, and that's one of the reasons that I got out of that industry because I realized that like our business is always at the mercy of Google. You see this happening a lot with YouTube creators now. Like it's, it's kind of, it's funny because it's like, you know, it just pivots to like the next, the next kind of media, popular medium, but it's the same thing. Like people um, are, you know, build their whole business around a certain platform that they don't control. And then when that platform changes or that company makes a change, you know, you can lose your whole business overnight. So, um, so, and that's, you know, again, that's kind of what you see happening with, with YouTube creators and the algorithm and they're so beholden by that, you know, by the algorithm and, and everything now. So, so that's, that's what inspired me to like, get out of that, get away from the idea of like, you know, all of our customers or all of our traffic is dependent on this other company and just build my own products where I can get customers from wherever. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a lot of like examples of that, you know, Amazon's one, a lot of uh, stores just sell on Amazon. And, you know, if Amazon decides that they want to start selling a product in that space, all of a sudden instantly you're gone from the Amazon search results. And uh, I've seen crazy yeah. success stories though. I don't know if you've heard of Miss Excel uh, on TikTok. No. Uh, she started, she just started creating like TikTok videos about how to do things in Excel. And she's, mm -hmm. you know, she's like, you know, she's a pretty woman. She's got like just really good energy about her. Like just this kind of like playful, inviting, you know, funny, humorous kind of like energy. And, but she's talking about how to do like macros or like formulas in Excel. So it's this juxtaposition, like this kind of like yeah, yeah. playful, like, you know, yeah. happy, positive, you know, pretty woman type of energy combined with like, Excel formulas. So it's this like brain juxtaposition that it's like, what the hell am I watching? Right. And she blew <laughs> up and yeah. just like went insane with views. And then she quickly like built a course business to yeah. monetize all the traffic. And she's doing mm -hmm. like $12 million in yeah. revenue in, in, in 2022. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's uh, you like, it's a, it's, it's, if you, you can, you can grow a business that way and do very, very well. Um, but there will be a time when what's her name, Miss <laughs> Mrs. Excel. Miss Excel, yeah. Ex, Miss, there will be a time when Miss Excel logs in and her traffic for for one reason or another, they change the algorithm, they do this, they do that. The I mean, I expand in the US or something. Uh, yeah, something happens and her and it's gone. Yeah. And, and and she'll still do probably well because she's collecting these. She's built. I assume she's building a list. She's probably building up on other platforms too, which is a which is a great way to you want to like diversify and and divest from like your once you start to blow up like that. Um, and that's a way that you can kind of mitigate some of your risk. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody that I personally knew in in that space that that had websites that were totally dependent on Google have divested out of them because it's that. just, you can't build. And, and, and the ones that were really smart were able to just, you know, they, they sold their sites, to public companies who overpaid for them mm. and they got out and then that was that. Right. So, um, so, but it's, 
but so I think that, that it, it's just history like repeating itself, you know. So so um, I, I hope to see Miss Excel just crush it and do keep doing, you know, keep on going forever. But I but if she's listening, please diversify into other platforms and you'll 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 thank me for that. <laughs> Words of wisdom being parted. I call it being smitten by the algorithm gods. Being, oh, and, and, you know, there's, there's nothing worse. And I've, you know, again, it's personal experience is you wake up one morning and you're like, why is my traffic down 90%? And then you're like, oh, it must be the sites down or something is, you know, and it will come back and it doesn't come back. And, uh, and that is a good way to learn a lesson. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a tough lesson you need to learn, but, but one that, that it's a good way to learn it because you'll never, you never make that mistake again. I have a friend who does like, I mean, he, he, he does consulting and he has a couple other legit businesses, but he does like these goofy, uh, like gray hat SEO affiliate marketing websites. Mm -hmm. And he'll just rank things, you know, using like gray hat and black hat. Yeah. And he did one where when Google first came out with brand schema, you could tell Google what your brand was called. Mm -hmm. He created a brand called Top Jobs Near Me and told Google that the brand is called Top Jobs Near Me. And uh, so if you Googled Top Jobs Near Me anywhere, it would show up. And then he would just basically like send all the traffic to Indeed and then get affiliate commissions from Indeed. And I think it was generating like $1,000 a day for a while. Yeah. Yeah. From like Indeed affiliate commissions. And then I think Google first like nuked it after they, you know, they like found out the the near me brand schema scam basically and like nuked all the near me businesses. And then also I think Indeed sh shut off the affiliate program or something too. So it was like double whammy there. And then that thing just like evaporated overnight because of that. But I think he always knew that, that it was going to happen at some point. And it was just kind of like a temporary, you know, short-term run, but that's uh that's a pretty good example of it right there. Right, yeah, and that's, you know, it's just um I think at a point you just get worn out from that and like for me it was like I'm going to build something that is going to stand on its own and um and we can use, you know, we we I spend a lot of money on AdWords, I spend a lot of money on all different types of advertising platforms. But it, but I'm not beholden to them or, or not not um, you know not being held hostage in a way, which is good. Snap it up any uh, cheap Twitter ads these days? Yeah. Oh, not yeah. Not, but I haven't I have I haven't tried Twitter um, yet. But it's uh, but I I I assume but you know those are places to look um, because you can get I've in the past there have been situations and where like especially i think like ad networks and stuff where people have kind of moved on from it um like it's not in the news every day you know but but they're like the traffic's still there so you can get you can do some really um interesting things and have some Twitter really successful has, uh, mass exodus of the advertisers because uh i think i just heard about this on uh the all in podcast they were talking about basically when elon musk took over twitter Mm -hmm. All these like 4chan bot attacks started attacking Twitter and posting like millions of racist tweets to be like, uh -huh. you know, they were trying to basically send the message that like, oh, Twitter is actually like more racist now that uh, Elon Musk. Took oh, it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's like more racial, you know, spewing, you know, content on there right. now. And it was all just like 4chan bot traffic with like no and the followers. brands are like, we don't want to touch this with a 10 foot exactly yeah and so, the, the twitter like, manager was already like shit to begin with so it's like yeah. all right everything just you know their ad revenue i think took a waterfall in q4 and uh so i don't know maybe there's like you know facebook ads are cheap again i think so there's probably some yeah. opportunities in the the you know advertising space to get a a better return on ad spend than we all got in 2021 and early 2022 i know <laughs> when everybody was was you know on there so um yeah, I mean, there's a lot, a, a lot that we really, you know, I, I still use a lot of AdWords and um, and Facebook ads, of course. Um, but, you know, I've talked to you this about this um, with you before, but like I, we still find that that the most valuable, um, valuable marketing for us is, is email marketing through through just sending people emails it's still you get to people really you know 
efficiently, quickly. Um, and and that's that's one of the reasons why we put so much focus on that with writing IO, like delivering your content where people are most likely to read it, which is in their email inbox. Um, email, it's funny, email is like this thing where like people keep trying to kill it and it just will just won't die, you know. And I I can't imagine how much money has been pumped, you know, from a venture capital standpoint into like the end of email. And yet email is still, I mean, I guess you have Slack and stuff now, but, but still like, you know, it's, it's still there. And I think it's because it's so personal, like people, people um, get, you know, all of their import, what they used to get through the mail, obviously in email. So your bills, your, you know, everything. And so that's why I think it's going to be here for, for, uh, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, and not so anytime much. soon. I mean, smoke signals have finally died, I think. I, I don't I haven't sent any smoke signals in a while, but like, you know, if people still send me mail. I got Christmas cards this year. And uh so there's still a, a purpose for mail, and maybe eventually mail will die because it's you know inefficient. But uh, you know, as far as uh email goes, I think it's I think you're right. It's like different expectations. Like if I get an email, typically it's more of like a longer term action that I need to take with documents attached and like steps and more detailed outline. But like Slack or a text message is just like, hey, quick, I need you to know this right now. And on a Slack or a text message, the expectation is that I respond pretty quickly. Whereas on an email, the expectation is that, you know, I take time to digest it and review it and formulate a response and then get back maybe tomorrow or sometime this week. Yeah, that's a great point that they're they're really two focusing on two time almost like different time frames. Um, and so like from a I guess it would then depend on the type of product you're selling, but um for a, a software as a service business, you're looking for cust- you're, you're, like your your ideal customer. Sure, you want to get you want them to take like an immediate action, but really like you want them to be a customer for years to come because um, you know obviously the longer uh, or or the lower your churn rate, the higher your valuation. Um, so or it has an impact on your valuation, I should say. I'm a big fan of email though, man. I mean, we've at Curotech, we've landed seven figure clients through cold email, just uh, getting really clear on like what our value proposition is, figuring out who the small set of companies, you you know, the ideal customer profile for that value prop are, and then figuring out exactly what buyer personas inside of those ICPs we need to reach and then getting really targeted messaging to those people. And uh, yeah, we've landed multiple seven figure deals out of just cold email and plenty more six figure deals just out of like literally cold just emailing like, yeah, people. Exactly. And it's so overlooked. And it's it's because it's not the new, it's not new, obviously. It's not in the new, you know, it's just this thing we've all, at least for you and me, it's like we've, we've kind of always had this. And, um, you know, I think it just gets so overlooked, but there's so much opportunity there. And especially when you're still, when you're at, um, a certain, like your business is at a certain scale. So I think, yeah, like if you're doing, um, any type of like, um, product development for other com- like, like, um, development for other companies, consulting work, or even like you have a, a software as a service business and you're at a smaller scale, like sending people like, just writing emails to people is just such a great way to, to get your first, your first customers. Um, and that's just what we've done like time and time again. And, and, and it works. And I think people just, they, for some reason, like they're always chasing, you know, I mean, I can understand why, because it's, that's what's you just read about all the time. Like, you know, how to, how to market on Snapchat, how to market on Instagram, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, just writing a couple emails to the right people, can have an amazing effect um, and and the and more importantly like the return you know with adwords and with with um with facebook ads and everything you're always like looking at your looking at your roi and and um but with an email it's literally costs nothing and even if you're sending email at scale you know we send emails um at you know hundreds of thousands at a time for certain um, things that we do. And, you know, st- it's like, even with, even with like a, like an email provider, um, it's like $50, you know, or something to send like a hundred thousand emails. So, 
you know, whereas if you get a, try to get a hundred thousand clicks on Google, like, or on AdWords, like that's going to be at least, you know, I don't know, 50 grand or something. So the trick is quality uh, though, not trying to blast out like quantity to a vague, right. you know, a vague well, message. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to be very clear that I'm not, I'm not suggesting people go out and just spam people with, I'm saying if you have a qualified list, if you build up like over time, if you build up a list, that list costs you almost nothing to market to, you know, like, whereas with AdWords or, or a third party advertising uh, platform, you know, you're paying anywhere from for, again, for quality. And I guess it also depends on your the niche that you're in, but you could be paying 50 cents for a click. You could be paying $2 for a click. Um, you know, you could I mean, be paying. Much ask, more. Man, how come you never responded to my Gucci shoes and my uh, energy supplement emails I was sending you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I was hoping you'd sign up, man. <laughs> well, you know, well, they didn't make, they made, they, they hit the spam, you know, then that's the, uh, that, that is the one, the problem, Brian, is you, when you're sending emails every day, promoting your, uh, your fake Rolex, your fake Rolex business. <laughs> Eventually, they start going into spam. So you have to be very careful with the types of your 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 frequency, the frequency at which you send, and uh, and again qualify the the emails that you have on your list. Do you warm your inboxes? Um, Do you ever use any warming plot? I had episode five. I had Mike Benson on. Uh, He's a friend of mine. He's here in Philly, and he started a company called Warm Up Inbox. And uh, oh, okay. he built it in like it was his seventh or eighth company. So it looks like an overnight success on paper, but it was like one of those eight years in the making, right? Yeah, overnight successes. And uh, he built this thing from like the first line of code, from the idea, and the first line of code. I was his like first or second customer. I actually responded to a Google ad that didn't have a product yet, and, uh, and then he like emails me back. He's like, all right, cool. Uh, you want to hop on a zoom call? I got a wireframe to show you. And, uh, and then like we, you know, I kind of gave him feedback and then he built the product around like me and a few people who responded to his Google ads. But, uh, it, it from 11 months from like this time he had the idea to the time he sold the company, I don't know exactly what the number was, but it's like, it was, you know, like life-changing money. So probably high seven or eight figure exit. And, yeah. uh, he, um, he, you know, he built this platform, basically his inbox warming It's called warmupinbox.com. And it, it got rolled up into like a private equity portfolio. But uh, basically, it's like this closed network of email, like sales, like SDR teams and email marketing teams that connects their inbox through like Outlook 365 or Google Workspace. And then it creates email traffic across the network. And then if something lands in a spam folder, it marks it as not spam, marks it as important, and then it automatically oh, archives it so it doesn't clutter mm -hmm. your inbox. So it's like basically training like the Google and uh, Microsoft and like all the ISP. Right, like all, all this, like this layer of AI that, deter again, determines kind of like your your whole, uh, uh, we're all behold, we're, we're all just... Yeah, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, you can't spam like you can't. It won't make up for like actual spamming. You'll still go to the spam folder if you're actually spamming. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing too much volume, like you can't be sending more than like 100 emails per day from a single inbox. And even on a single domain, if you just have a single cold email domain, you have to really limit it to like low hundreds across the whole domain per okay. day. But, uh, you know, like if you start, you know, let's like I have curotech.com is my company. And then we do cold email, but we'll do it from like curotech.net. And then, but that's a new domain. It doesn't have history or authority. So to build initially to build that history and authority and trust, we'll run warming on it for like the first three months before we send the first cold email. So by the mm -hmm. time we send the first cold email, it's warmed up and it's ready to land in the inbox folder. And, uh, and it will land in the primary folder of the recipient. As long as we don't, you know, that'll quickly change if people hit the spam button too many times right, and yeah, it'll yeah, quickly yeah. nuke the domain in the inbox. So you have to still like quality is still important, but uh, such an interesting business. Uh, and he just found this wedge at the right time at the right yeah, place. Yeah. And now there's like 50 companies or 25 companies that copy that are doing it. Well, I've seen I have, I have seen that in other places. Um, we use we work with Mailgun who they're like. Um, like, like, so for example, ConvertKit, who we were talking about earlier, 
Um, I don't know if they still use them, but um, like, so they are actually, they sit on top of an email delivery service and that would be Mailgun. So um, since in many ways we're kind of doing similar things with, we just send email for other people in volume um, with writing.io, we plug into this service and then they are the ones that actually send out the email. It's different than like a MailChimp or something like that because they're they're not providing you with like a a front end like interface and and they're they're purely about sending email at scale. Um and then and built for applications um and software as a service providers that um, but mail guns transactional emails. That Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you would exactly. use it for like, if you're an e-com store, you send like your customer receipts and your tracking info from there. Or if you're like Uber, you would use it for sending like, you know, your receipt or your rides here. Or, right. or you if know. you're, again, if you're convert kit, you build your product on top of it and you use them to actually send the emails in the background. So like convert kit, what they do is they, or what they did, I don't know if they still do this or not, but they, um, you know, they plug into Mailgun and all of their, like they build the the experience on the front end. Like here's how, here's, you know, I, I log into ConvertKit and I build my, my email funnel and everything. But then when an email is actually sent, it goes from ConvertKit actually sends it to the Mailgun API and Mailgun is the one, the service that actually sends it out. So what's really interesting though, is like, so Google and Microsoft, their algorithms learn about all this stuff and they know, all right, so Mailgun is probably typically going to be something that goes in the marketing folder or the promotions full, you know, the marketing and promotions or the updates or the forums folder. So then it just needs to figure out which one it is. So then it learns like if it's a receipt, then it probably goes in the updates folder. If it's a tracking number, it probably goes in the updates folder. If it's like a newsletter, it probably goes in the marketing folder. If it's you know, like someone responds to you on the, you know, credit card forum, it probably goes in the forums folder. Uh, but the way that like, if you use, you know, we use Growbots for outreach, or there's like outreach.io, there's Woodpecker, there's like all these different platforms. And those are like SaaS platforms that sit on top of your Google workspace or on top of your Out Outlook 365 account. So it's sending from like an actual inbox. And it's just like the abstraction layer that sits on top of that. Right, and exactly. Piles the sequences. Yeah. Yeah, And then the warm-up inbox trains Google and Microsoft to send those emails to the primary inbox. Exactly. It, yeah. it trains them to see it as like a communication from a real person and not an automated. Not from, yeah, not from, a, ser not from a, a service. So, I mean, and you're going to run into the same issues with any, you know, MailChimp, AWeber, um, Constant Contact. I mean, again, they're all plugging into those. So it's, so that's, that's why like, um, when we were talking earlier, I said, like, if, like, if you're at a certain scale that you can get your initial customers, because what you're, what you're through email, because what you're doing is you're like, you're sending those yourself from your own inbox. Like that's, that's kind of what I was referring to versus, versus creating, um, you know, automated email campaigns. And, and that's another discussion for another time. But, if, but what you can do is you can test things out, like on your own, like, if you're launching a new product, you have a list of people you want to send it to. You literally write the e log in a Gmail, write the email, you know, send it to everybody individually, or however we use a mail merge or however you want to do it. But send it from your inbox, and then you can do that with a you know a couple different emails. See which ones work the best, and then you take those and you build out an automated sequence on a platform like. Uh, ConvertKit or MailChimp or even writing IO. Mm, yeah, I love that. It's so cool, man. There's like, this is what I love about building startups and tech companies. There's like a million levers you can pull and it's like figuring out like what levers to pull. Like Simon says, like what buttons do I push in what sequence to get the win? And yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like the growth hacking. Like that's like those wins to me are, you know, it's like, uh, it's like when you pop the bubbles on the bubble wrap, like popping all the bubbles. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, so it's, satisfying to. Uh, yeah. In which order to, and then which button that, like the one button, like that you don't want to press that opens the trap door under, <laughs> under yeah. you know, the dunk tank, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's a good one too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's good. But, yeah. Good. Uh, Love that. But a lot of it is, yeah, you're right. It's just like pulling, pulling different levers in different orders and, and seeing, 
kind of which, and then trying to figure out like, okay, which lever, I just got that sale, like which, what, what lever was that from again? <laughs> like, cause that's another big thing. You're pulling so many levers at the same time, you know? How do I repeat so, that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. All right. I want to try a new segment here. I've never done this. Uh, it's January 4th, 2023 today. Uh, I don't know when this will go live, maybe a couple of weeks or a week from now. Uh, let's do a predictions for 2023. And then maybe we'll like get back on in January 2024. Okay. And we can like see what our prediction predictions, you know, if they came true or not. Uh, but like, specifically, you know, I, I, I think you're perfect for this, because you're well rounded with like finance and business and economics, but you're also, you know, a tech guy and a founder and an entrepreneur. So you see, you know, the details and you see the big picture all, all at the same time. Uh, I, I can go with my predictions, but what are what are your predictions for 2023 uh, business markets? You know, get into any anything you want to predict for for this calendar year? Wow, that's uh, a that's a that's a, a wide open question. I have to think about. Well, why don't you go and I'll I have to think about this for a second. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to go. So I think uh, I think we're headed into a recession that is deeper than what uh, what, you know, the media has been publishing for the last quarter mm -hmm. or two. And I think we're not going to see the end of it until sometime in 2024, if not potentially early 2025. I think the Fed's going to continue to raise rates. I think they uh, they said it. They said they're going to uh, err on the side of overcorrection. Because they can always pull the lever, you know, going back to the levers, they can always pull the lever to, uh, you know, course correct later and re-stimulate the economy with uh, surplus cash. But they, you know, they can print more money and they can, you know, infuse cash into the markets and, you know, create spending, but they can't correct inflation. So uh, they're, I think they're going to continue to err on the side of overcorrection. And I think when you can get, uh, you know, returns on, uh, I think when investors, when, you know, uh, institutional investors and, you know, private equity, uh, you know, uh, you know, the people who are the family offices that are funding private equity firms and, uh, you know, these like large, uh, large institutional investors that are typically funding all this M&A and venture backed deal flow. Uh, I think uh, when they can get pretty decent returns on the bond market and in the, uh, you know, corporate debt market, uh, you know, when they're seeing like five, six, 10% returns on that corporate debt and bond market uh, investment strategy, I think they're going to err on the side of that, as opposed to doing, you know, more risky M&A deals yeah. and private equity, yeah. or more risky venture deals where you've got like a 10 I, or 20% hurdle to get to get through. I, total, I totally agree. I think it's, it's a it's a reckoning, it's going to be a reckoning. I mean, it already is, you can see it happening. Um, I, I think like whenever you start to see like massive layoffs, um happening that you just like it's 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 a pretty ominous sign and it's usually not followed by amazing you know miraculous growth or development because you have all of this this you kind of have this void that's created and i think it takes takes a while for that void to become filled and things to kind of become you know, productive again, I guess you could say like, so I think that as you pointed out, like the, I think it's probably going to be a longer recession than, um, I don't know about like how deep it's going to be necessarily, but I think from a, from a time frame, it's going to be longer. Do you say shallow and long? Like, like sha maybe shallower. Yeah. Shallower. I wouldn't say shallow and just long. Um, because you're going to have all of you. Have, I mean, you already have all of these kind of ripples happening. I think the other thing is like people always like, you know, you see so much kind of fear built around the stock market and everything. And honestly, like the stock market and equities could have already seen or or have experienced the majority of the pain. But that doesn't that doesn't mean that like the like it's it's probably backloaded. So um so you know the stock market and everything is is the first to get hit and then what you're going to see is like from a from a jobs and a growth standpoint like that I guess the the market's pricing in has probably has already priced in 
a recession. I think there's still um, more to go, especially in growth stocks. I think there's and, probably going to be some bankruptcies and some restructurings mm-hmm. that are oh, coming yeah, there, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think oh, Bitcoin sure. could go to 5,000 maybe, five 6,000. Yeah. I think that's a possibility. Yeah, for sure. But I think that like people, so but my point is that people get like hyper-focused on the equities market and what you're going to see is, is that the actual, like the pain from the recession isn't necessarily there. It's going to be obviously hiring is going to slow down. Interest rates are going to continue to be high. And you're going to get this combination of things where when hiring slows down and we have high interest rates, um, it's just a big question mark as to how that, like what the, what the, what the end game is there, or what the, what the total impact is for those two factors, um, and, and you you know we've had cheap or almost free, essentially free money for you know a decade now. Um, you know when you're borrowing money at four percent, and it's you know everything's growing at ten percent. Um, you know that's you're making six percent a year or doing nothing. You know on nothing, so. I think it was really easy to see it to see a good return regardless of where you invested your money because there it was just you know there's free money um and now that that's being as you pointed out like to do a venture deal now it makes a lot less sense when you can plow it into a fund where you're going to get a 10% or you know, we could, could go higher, could be, could be, you know, 15% return um, on something that's backed by real, you know, that's actually backed by collateral. Um, so I think, so I think as, as somebody who like is bootstrapping a company, it's a great time. It's actually a great time because you're going to have a lot of tech talent that is now looking for a new job. And, um, and so maybe you fall into that category. Maybe you've been at a company forever and or not forever, but for a, for a while, and you've had this great idea, like now might be a great time to think about, um, taking that idea and actually, actually building something, um, building something. That's that's the second part of my prediction. I think the next Googles, the next Facebooks, the next Stripes, uh, the founders are meeting right now as we speak, getting coffee and uh, hacking in their apartments right now as we speak. And uh, and we're going to hear about their companies in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I, agree. I think uh, so. So I would add that I think this is going to be the year of the electric vehicle. And the reason I say that is that you have a new federal tax credit coming into play, but you also, and perhaps more importantly, have all of these other companies that have been kind of, you know, obviously been behind Tesla for a long time. Uh, these the more the, the kind of the big automakers, but they finally, I think, have a, a lot of them have started to break through with their own electric vehicles, and. Um, I think you're just going to see that that market just explode this year. Interesting. What uh, what's the new tax credit? I haven't uh, haven't heard about. Well, I it. think it's I think it's um, they just they brought back the existing credit that had expired. And I'm I'm not ex- totally sure or 100 percent sure on this, but I believe it's 70. It used to be 7,500 dollars. It was like you get a. Um, but what they did is they they. They said each originally they said each manufacturer gets, I think it was like a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand or something of these credits. And then after those are used up, that manufacturer no longer gets the like those cars are no longer um uh those cars no longer qualify for the credit. So what happened obviously is that Tesla tapped out on the on their credits first because they just all they sell is electric cars. Um, and then you had other manufacturers um, that still had the credit, but then they started to reach that limit as well. Um, and so, and then there's there's another provision on there about uh, if it's an SUV or not, and there's a couple other like some fine print with it. But for for the most part, I believe it's if it's an electric vehicle, 
there's a credit of up to $7,500. So what it does is it brings down. So I think essentially, if you look at the current car manufacturers and like the electric cars that they are coming out with, this year specifically, there are a lot that are coming out that are in like that mid range. I mean, they're still kind of, they're still pricey, but they're in like the mid, mid tier, you know, 30 to 60,000. And so that credit is going to bring, obviously brings that down. And then it, it really creates um, some serious headwinds for Tesla because now you have, you know, f- 10 other companies coming at you. Um, and um, it looks like they might be having some demand issues on there. And, uh, and now they have a huge, um, a huge, the ability to produce a lot of cars, but they may have overbuilt that. So I think it will just- That's actually uh, a possibility too, that one of Elon Musk's companies kind of gets a reckoning this year. It's a reckoning, yeah. Um, I I just think that they've been, Tesla in particular has has been promising a lot of things for a long time. And- Yeah, where's the Cybertruck, man? That thing was supposed to be out like two years (laughs) ago. (laughs) <laughs> and the self and the self driving you know we all love to drive to to get in a car with a with a 15 and a half or a 16 year old and put them at the wheel and let them drive for the first time that's always the the most relaxing <laughs> calm <laughs> wonderful experience and that, that appears to be what um what tesla has built with their uh, self driving now it, i'm sure over time it will get better but um again like i, I just I see this tidal wave of competition coming in and it will just be very interesting to see, see what well, happens. If they actually pull it off, man, think about it. Uh, truck drivers are gone. Taxi, taxi and Uber is gone. Uh, you know, last mile is gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, all these businesses, multi, you know, possibly tr- over a trillion dollars of like market capitalization just turns into a fraction of that where you're just producing vehicles and, you know, these vehicles become like autonomous systems and more efficient too. Like if you have all these autonomous vehicles and you've got like a, you know, you've got a Tesla driving around, you can just optimize everything. So it goes and picks up a pizza and drops it off. Then it picks up a person and drops them off at the airport. Then it grabs cargo from the airport and drops it off at the, you know, at the receiver. And it's just zipping all around to like a perfect route. The biggest impact is really on, on real estate. Because you've just created like 30% more buildable land because you don't need parking lots, essentially. Mm. Um, or you, you reduce can also the- reduce traffic, too. If you put everything on a self-driving network, you can route vehicles so drivers don't have to look at Google Maps and like figure out where to drive. You can literally like reroute traffic in the most efficient patterns. Patterns, yep. So you kill traffic. But also, I think traffic gets reduced to... Well... Because you just don't have as many cars on the road at any given time, you know, like um, it just naturally, like if, if cars are super efficient and they're kind of operating more like planes, like you think about, you know, a plane, you, you get on a plane on a flight and chances are that plane has flown already, you know, three times, That's it's already completed three trips previously. And it's after you get off, it goes and it flies for 18 hours a day is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, you kind of can do technically do the same thing. There's nothing preventing you from doing the same thing with cars at that point. And it will be interesting to see if the economics warrant, like if there, if people decide to start making the trade-off of like, okay, I don't need to necessarily own a car anymore because um, I can just summon one on demand at any time. And I save, and it ends up, you know, saving money and, 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 and I, that, that money can be better spent elsewhere. So, yeah, so I think there's, but again, I think it, like, it's, it's kind of like going back to the, to the chat um, GPT thing. Um, it's just like, it seems like it's really close, but it's like an exponentially hard problem to solve. That last um, 10% is always the hardest. That last 10% and like, you know, you, you can only run over so many people, you know, and, uh, and I know that like Tesla people will be like, yeah, but you know, look at, look at the, look at. The, the safety of, of um, you know, te- the autopilots involved in less, but actually I, I just read something somewhere that 
now that they've turned on the full self-driving, I think they stopped publishing their safety reports because you're starting to see that um, mm. that that tick up significantly now that it's yeah. available to everybody. So I think it will, I think, you know, don't get me wrong. I think eventually it will get there. It's not a matter of if it's going to get there, if we're going to have self-driving, but are we going to have, is, is this going to be the year of self-driving? It's not. Um, and, and so that, that is my other prediction that 2023 is not the year of self-driving. It's the year of the electric car. Um, and, but it's not the year of self-driving. Cool. I like it. Let's put it down in the books and revisit this in uh, January 2024 and see uh, see if we are right or, or wrong or somewhere in the middle on our predictions. Cash flow. Did you clear your cash flow?